Um, okay, welcome uh, everyone. So I want to give a bit of a high-level idea of uh, what we've been doing in a series of three papers which are focused on fast, secure computation for the case of Boolean circuits. Um, this is the series of three papers joined with uh, Ariel Noff, my student here, and, and uh, a number of other people. Uh, I, I planned on a bit more of a general audience, but I guess all the general people went to algorithms and uh, networking, but in any case, uh, uh, I'll give the, the background. So secure computation, we have a set of parties with private inputs who want to compute a joint function of their inputs while preserving a number of security properties, privacy, correctness, and so on. We know that we can do anything, any efficient function can be securely computed. The question is how efficient. Uh, a much better example than the ones we've been previously using for where secure computation is useful is a recent uh, application which took place in Boston. The Boston's Women's Workforce Council wanted to carry out a study on the gender, gender wage gap in Boston. And they went to a number of different companies and they asked them to give them information about different uh, positions in the company and, pay and, and different grades of position and uh, also how, what the, uh, how much women earn in those positions and how much men in, in, earn in those positions. All of the companies unanimously said, get lost. Uh, there's no way we're giving you that information. There are two explanations. One is well, that information contains private confidential information about our employees, and that is indeed the case. If you have a marketing department with three men and one woman, and you give the average wage of men and women in your marketing department, then you reveal the actual wage of one of the women working there. I think probably uh, a more significant, or at least no less significant reason was they were worried about being sued if it turned out that their company had a much larger wage gap than the other companies, then they you know, possibly would be uh, up for a lawsuit, and therefore they all said, resoundingly said no. Uh, this was a joint work with Boston University to try and do this, uh, uh, to do this computation. And in fact, all of the companies agreed to give the information to the university in plain text. They all agreed that as long as the university would take all legal responsibility in case there was a breach. Now, you can imagine to yourselves what the university lawyers said <laughs> to this proposition. They said, get lost as well. And, but everybody agreed to do a secure computation. And this is actually the first time that a significant amount of data about uh, gender wage gap was gathered, real data from real companies, and they managed to get those statistics because everybody was willing to participate in this secure computation. They actually did a rather naive secure computation with two, uh, two servers in the cloud, but uh, uh, they say everyone shared their data to those two servers, but this is actually an excellent, a really, really good application of secure computation, then I think we'll see many more of these types of computations, and there are many use cases, especially related to smart cities. And if you don't know what I meant by that, then you can ask me afterwards. Uh, there are two, call, two goals for secure computation. One is low latency. We want to try and get our protocol to finish as fast as possible. And the other is thr high throughput. We want to try and carry out as many computations per second as possible. And whether I want laten low latency or high throughput depends on the application. If a user is waiting for something, I need low latency. If I want to compute a lot of statistics about, uh, the, uh, about the workforce, then typically what I want is high throughput because it's not a real-time sort of uh, computation. When I say, when I think about throughput though in this talk, I'm, we're actually interested in the entire running time, not separating an offline and an online time. There are also a lot of works which pay a, a heavier offline time and for a fast online time to get uh, better throughput in online time only. Low latency protocols are constant round, therefore they can even work well on a slow network. Uh, they have a and they have a constant, uh, they have a constant round number of, comp number of rounds, and they follow the garbled circuit approach. That also means, though, that each gate has a significant communication penalty, some hundreds of bits, and that, makes, that means that as far as throughput goes, it's, uh, they're not very good because you have to pay a lot of communication for every single gate, and the the bottleneck is typically, not always, but typically the communication. High throughput, comp high throughput protocols work following the secret sharing approach and therefore they have many rounds. You have a round of communication for every layer of the circuit you're computing, but they typically send much less information per gate and so you can pack many more, um, many more computations into a single message to filling up the, the bandwidth that you have. 
we're going to look at uh, fast, high throughput uh, computations, and we're considering specifically the case of three parties with an honest majority and security with the boards. We we'll also talk about semi-honest and malicious security. In semi-honest, the parties run the protocol as they're supposed to. In malicious, they can do uh, any, any, run any arbitrary attack strategy. But um, even though we are in honest majority setting and you can actually get fairness and guaranteed output delivery if you have a broadcast channel, we are uh, happily or will, willingly giving up on those properties to get higher efficiency. And so that, that's what we've done here. It doesn't mean you can't uh, further bootstrap it to get, uh, to get fairness, but we haven't done it in these works. So the starting point is we're going to use very, very basic XOR secret sharing. So we have, uh, even though it's a, only one corrupted, you'll see why we want to do this later on. So we have X and Y being simply XOR shared, X1, X2, X3 are random under the constraint of the XOR to X and likewise Y. And if each party just gets one bit of, the sh one bit of shares, then you can XOR with no interaction whatsoever. Each party simply locally XORs its shares. What happens when you want to compute an AND gate? So you need to compute this, uh, this formula, and if you open it up, it comes out to, to this uh, long thing, and you can see that on the diagonal, you can actually compute by yourself. So party one can compute X1 and Y1, party two, X2 and Y2, and so on and so forth. But all the other uh, all of the other uh, operands need actually to, the ands need to be computed using interaction between them because to compute x1 and y3, parties p1 and p3 need to interact because they hold that information. However, if we use replicated secret sharing instead, then we can save a lot of interaction. What's replicated secret sharing? Instead of party p1 holding just x1, it holds two shares, x1 and x3. In fact, each party holds two shares. So, uh, and it's missing the third chair. Since we're looking at a most one corrupted party, this still uh, maintains privacy of, of the shares. Any single party cannot learn anything about the value that is shared. If you look at now what they're holding, so each party holds two bits, let's go back and have a look at that equation we're talking about before. You can still do XOR with no, uh, with no interaction. What happens when we want to do AND? We need to compute this formula but if you, you can note that the first row can be computed single-handedly by the first party. Okay, so single-handedly the first party can actually compute uh, X, uh, all of these three terms because it has X1, X3 and Y1, Y3. Likewise, the second party can compute the second row all by itself and the third can compute the third row all by itself. Which means that all they need to do, in fact, locally they already now have a basic XOR sharing of the result. Okay, so if you look at that, with local computation, each has a basic XOR sharing result, but they need to transfer it back to a replicated secret sharing, so they continue doing this. It's actually enough for each one to send a single bit. You have to add a mask to this thing using correlated randomness, which we can do without any interaction. And it means you can compute an entire AND gate with just a single bit of communication. Okay, and that, since we're looking and thinking about the bottleneck being communication, by reducing the communication down to its seeming minimum, seeming minimum because again, we don't have any proof that you can't amortize amongst many gates, but if you look at a gate by gate approach, then definitely one bit is the minimum. And it's also a very simple communication pattern, which when you want to implement this helps a lot. It's like a ring, uh, P1 sends to P2, P3, P3, and P3 back to P1. So correlated randomness, we can, yeah, you can by uh, initially exchanging pairwise uh, AES keys, then you can actually generate the correlated randomness we need without any interaction afterwards. So P1 and P2 share a key, P2 and P3 share a key, and P1 and P3 share a key, and, and then you can do local AES operations and get the correlated randomness you need. For example, the correlated randomness means that here they'll need to generate alpha 1, alpha 2, or alpha 3 that XOR to 0. And given the setup that I said, you can do that without any interaction. No, no, no. I mean, it's, a t it's something you need to mask, but you can do this without the cost, the actual cost in, in, in interaction to the product communication is zero, because it's just exchanging those keys at the beginning. The operation, you have to do an AES, one AES for 128 bits of randomness, which is very insignificant when uh, using, using good hardware. So I'm not counting that cost. Now, when we implemented this, and implementing it is non-trivial to do it in a uh, to, to do it very well. You needed to we needed uh, to use uh, Intel Intrinsics, a lot of the, the the good properties that that 
modern hardware gives you with bit slicing and other things because you have to run a, a lot in parallel. But we could actually run this on three mid-level servers. So 20 core servers is not considered very high end, by the way. It's a mid-level server. Uh, three mid-level servers, uh, we could compute over 7 billion AND gates a second. Concretely, if you wanted to translate this into AS operations, we could co compute 1.3 million AS operations a second. Concretely, you could convert this into computing Kerberos for login. So generating all the Kerberos tickets and doing all the work you need to do, uh, we can support 45, a login storm of 45,000 logins per second on Kerberos. Okay, so this is... Uh, uh, For the login, because yeah, in Kerberos you generate a ticket granting ticket using a long-term key, which is your hash of your password or whatever it is, and then afterwards you just use a session key. That session key you don't need to protect in secret computation anymore. So only the part of the code. Exactly. Yeah, afterwards, once you've done the login, you, you just use cur regular Kerberos, Kerberos, and here you can protect those long-term keys of all the players, whether they be parties or servers, and you can protect them and not having them open and use secure computation to compute them. So this is very, very practical, very, very fast. It's only secure in the presence of semi-honest adversaries. It's also private in the presence of malicious adversaries, but I want to go into that definition. It's a weaker notion. The uh, main challenge, the next challenge is how much do we have to pay to go from semi-honest to malicious? How fast can we make that transition? Uh, we used to think that it's orders of magnitude more. We already know that it's not that. In, in the case of arithmetic circuits, there are general uh, um, there are general methods by, by uh, um, in fact, it's not just arithmetic circuits, right? In, also for Boolean circuits. There are general methods, but when you're doing anything which is general, you pay some additional overhead. When you specifically want the fastest protocol you can get for three parties on its majority, then you can do a lot of fine tuning to get very uh, fast efficiency, and that's uh, what we did here. In general, there are three problems you have. You have to make sure that people share their inputs correctly, get their outputs correctly, and also that the AND gates are computed correctly, because in this protocol that I showed you for semi AND, any party can simply flip its speed, and obviously the result will be incorrect, and that would be insecure. So we're going to focus on how we can emulate the circuit efficiently, and we're going to use the known method of beaver triples. A multiplication triple is simply uh, a triple of shares, A, B, and C, so that A times B equals C. And we look, think about random triples, so A and B are generated at random. Um, then if you have such triples, then Beaver proposed this uh, following procedure. If you have two shares, X and Y, that you want to multiply, or AND in this case, and you're given a multiplication triple, so you're given this A, B, and C, which is already correct, then you can do this following procedure. You can open x plus a and y plus b, we'll call that rho and sigma. So you can open these two values. Note that opening them is fine because the real value of x that you want to hide is, that is secret is hidden by a, the real value of y is hidden by b. And then you can compute this funny equation z is c plus rho times sigma minus rho times b plus sigma times a. If you haven't seen this before, it opens up to this uh, nice uh, uh, equation, and then everything, almost everything, cancels out nicely. So there are two ABs that you add and subtract. You then have XBs and a plus XB minus XB, and a plus AY minus AY, and you're left only with XY. So you can now m do this AND with, uh, uh, via such a procedure. I note also the similar procedure can also be used to verify if you've multiplied correctly. So notice sorry, you're multiplying user, but if you did a multiplication on the side, you can use that to verify by subtracting z, doing, doing the same thing at the top, c plus rho sigma, et cetera, minus z, and seeing that you get zero. Okay, so this is the way we can use multiplication triples. And then we now try to use this in our, to boost our semi-honest protocol. So in the same way we can generate correlated randomness with that interaction, you can use the same type of method to generate shares of A and B with this replicated secret sharing without any interaction whatsoever. So that's very nice, and no one knows A and B. Uh, and then you can compute C using the semi-honest protocol, so it's just one bit of interaction, and now you have a triple A, B, and C. The only problem is you don't know if it's correct. But you at least uh, got these, uh, you can get these original triples at very, very low cost. Okay? So it's just one bit of communication. Money, you look uh, like something's bothering you. Is it, uh... So when you're trying to, uh, you're doing this, I just want to, to make sure I understand. You're trying to do uh, this sharing in order to verify uh, the other computation. In, and now you're saying, how can I, and now, given that you've used this, now this is in a semi-honest manner, you, you, you want just to be able to verify this computation. 
Exactly. If I can verify this computation on random triples, then I can use that and do everything in, with full security. So how do we verify that C is correct? And the thing that comes to mind uh, is cut and choose. Cut and choose we used to from the YAR world. It's very expensive, but it's actually uh, nowhere near as expensive as we think, especially when you amortize over a large amount. And the big advantage here is that the generation of triples is dirt cheap. It's a single bit. It's almost no computation, so we can actually generate a huge amount, and then the combinatorics of cut and choose works uh, very much to our favor. So let's see what we can do. We can generate this very large array of triples. I'll tell you how big this array will be later on, but it'll be millions. And then we can randomly permute that array. And we can open C of those triples. Since we've already randomly permuted, the C that are opened are randomly chosen. Uh, how we do the random permutation is essentially, again, agree on random, uh, agree on an ASCII after the array is fi finalized, and on each can locally generate the permutation that you need. You open C triples. If one of the open triples is bad, then you abort, and you say, I've detected cheating. Otherwise, you proceed to the next stage, which is bucketing. So you take uh, each beta consecutive triples and consider that to be a bucket. And we already said that you can use triples to verify triples. So now, in each bucket, you use beta minus one of the triples to verify that the first one is correct. And the property that you get is that if any bucket is mixed, whereby mixed means that it contains both good and bad triples, then you will certainly ca uh, catch the adversary. So if any bucket contains both a good and a bad triple, then the verification procedure will detect this and the adversary will have lost. The only way the adversary can win is if all of the buckets are not mixed or homogeneous, so they're either all good or all bad. And if you think about this, this is a balls and buckets game, but you have a lot, a lot of balls, and you have to hope that any bad balls that you, can, you generate will fall into the same bucket and only into that bucket, and that probability becomes very, very small. So this is the combinatorial game that we're studying. Uh, we par parameterize it by A, N, B, and C. The adversary A will choose N, B, or N beta plus C balls, where each ball can be bad or good. It's up to the adversary's choice. Then we choose C of those balls at random and open them. If any of the C balls that we choose at random were bad, the adversary lost. The rest of the balls we throw into N buckets of size beta. And then the adversary will win if it turns out that all of these buckets are either fully bad or fully good. That's the game that we want to analyze. And what we want to uh, uh, do is, for a given security parameter, sigma, and a number of triples n that we want to generate, we want to find beta and c of minimal size that actually minimize n b plus n beta plus c. That's what we want to minimize, which is the number of triples overall that to, to we're going to create. So that the probability the adversary wins in this combinatorial game is 2 to the minus sigma. Okay? And when we're looking at concrete efficiency, combinatorics matter. So doing something which has less than anywhere in your analysis is not going to be a good thing. You want to try everything to be, to be equals or less than equals, but where there is an actual case that the adversary hits equals in, in your analysis. And we actually worked very, very hard to make our analysis as tight as possible because it affects, significantly affects the concrete security. So that... Exactly, exactly. And actually what turns out, which is very surprising, is that C is almost uh, inconsequential, and you can take C to be uh, equal to beta only, and that's enough. You don't have to open many triples. Previous analyses of these games, like that appeared in TinyOT, took C to be reasonably large, and we took it to be small. You have this very uh, clear to read and understandable uh, bound here, so I'll explain it for you. If you take concrete parameters that we want to generate a million triples, we want to co compute uh, a million AND gates, and we want 2 to the minus 40 to be the error, then concretely we can open only three, uh, we only need to open three triples versus 65,000 in the, in the tiny OT um, uh, analysis of the same game, and we can take buckets of size 3 instead of they had buckets of size 4. It's a 25% uh, improvement. It's only order one, but in concrete efficiency, that's important. So concretely, in order to generate a million, a million 
uh, triples that we can use for multiplying or, or computing AND gates, we need to generate 3.1 million, um, million triples. Now, these numbers become better as n becomes larger. And it's very intuitive. Actually, what we've proven is the best strategy of the adversary is to make uh, uh, one bucket, to try and get one bucket to be all bad. That's the best strategy the adversary can do. And given, once you've proven that's the best strategy, the rest becomes very easy. But then it becomes very clear the more buckets you create, the harder it is for the adversary to do that. And so the bucket size becomes smaller and smaller. In uh, um, TinyOT was actually, it's a protocol which is designed for a dishonest majority. So it's much, much more expensive. It's not their fault. It's a much, much harder setting than our setting. And that means that you're not, you, you, you actually even pay a lot, lot more because you have, you have to work with much smaller sizes. You can't afford to generate millions at a time. It's just far too expensive. We have the advantage and luxury that we can generate at one bit a triple. So generating three million triples is not even a lot. And in fact, we don't even do that. In order to get really high efficiency, high, high efficiency we generate, we work in 200, on 256 bit registers. So actually, we're generating 256 million triples at a time. So each triple is actually an array of 256 bit, 256 triples. Yeah. Correlated randomness, I'm not looking at, again, I'm, I want to pay for the offline on and online. I'm not looking at only the online cost. So this cost is important. And I guess that's part of when I spoke to people at Dyadic uh, who are doing secret computation in practice. The offline online, it's not that it's not very uh, attractive in some settings. It's, mu it's a much, much harder system to build and maintain. If you don't have to do it, then much prefer not to do it. And you also have to have a lot of knowledge about how your customers are going to be using this. So if you know that you have uh, a situation where, the night, where the, the, there's nothing happening at night, a lot in the day, then you can afford to do that, but you don't always have that information. If you look at the example I gave of the Boston Women's Workforce, there's no offline online there. It's a single computation. So if you want to do a very, very large computation with billions and billions and billions of gates, then you're going to pay for it all and you want to know the overall cost. So we're very interested in the cost of the offline as well. Okay, so at this stage what we have is that you generate n beta plus e triples, you open C of them, you split into buckets of size beta minus one, and we can, all do, we can do all of this at seven bits per AND gate, and that will give us so seven bits per triple, sorry, and then that will give us n triples. And at this point now, we can run the multiplication, which works by doing a single semi-honest multiplication and a verification, which adds three more bits, and you get 10 bits per AND gate. In fact, you don't even need to do, you can get this down to nine bits per AND gate, because you don't have to do multiplication and verification. You can do the multiplication directly via the Beaver triple that I said beforehand, so you get nine bits per AND gate. So we're now one order of magnitude more than... Uh, than semi-honest, but we'd, we'd like to do this uh, even better. And this is like a baseline protocol that we're Peter Eurocrypt done. We wanted to further improve it. Uh, I'll get to that uh, a bit later on. So when we, when we have this, we had that uh, the costs for computing a million AND gates is 10 bits per AND gate. We reduced this actually, uh, and I'll explain a little bit later on how we do it, but in not in too much detail, we actually end up reducing this to only seven bits per AND gate using a, long, a number of optimizations. So we, our aim is to reduce communication as much as possible, and the hope should be that this would run seven times slower than the semi-honest protocol. But we all understand that there are other things going on here. We have to do these permutations and bucketing and all of these things, so maybe we won't be able to. The only hope is that the semi-honest protocol, the operations are so efficient that maybe it, there was enough cycle time that's being, uh, that, that's spare, that we can do all of these other things and still push the communication up to its limit. Now, in the semi-honest protocol, by the way, we're doing seven uh, billion AND gates per second. We actually got up to six, about 70% of network utilization, which is, which is considered very, very high. So can we make this get to the same level of utilization so it'll run seven times the cost, so we'll get a billion AND gates per second instead of seven billion. However, in reality, if you just do this, even with a very highly optimized implementation, it's about 30% slower than expected. Okay? Uh, it's actually even slower, but there are other things we can fix. I want to relate to one specific thing that we needed to change that is, is a, a, an important takeaway point, at least in my opinion. So what's causing this 30% slowdown? 
The only way to really know is by implementing, well, it is implemented is by looking at a profile. Let's try and find out what, what's costing a lot. Because all the operations here are really, really dirt cheap. Maybe it's the AES, because you need to do this to generate all the randomness for the permutations. Maybe it's for the, for, for, and for the correlated randomness. Maybe it's something else. I don't know if you can read this, but this is like a, a graphical uh, inf interface for the benchmarking, and it shows you each, uh, uh, what each function is doing, and what's, what's circled here is something called shuffled all da data. That is the permutation on the array. Okay, that's what's actually costing a lot, and what you can even see is that you have this MPC while loop that actually gets the, uh, it gets the circuits, it gets the uh, triples and then runs the actual circuit, and you have here, here, short, and then you have a very long one. Why do you have a very long one here? Oh, here, this, this, says, this says MPC while loop, so that's the actual the MPC running the actual circuit, and it needs to get the triples from up here. So here, the MPC while loop is very short because it has triples, and suddenly at this point, it now has to stop because it doesn't have any triples available. It has to wait all of this time to get the triples, and what's actually called the taking the longest time in the triples is the shuffle all data uh, function, which is simply running a permutation in memory. So why is running a permutation in memory so expensive? Any idea? Cash misses. Cash misses. Now, if anybody in the industry tells you that encryption is expensive, you can tell them AES is four times faster than reading from memory. Okay? Encryption is not expensive. In fact, reading from memory can be expensive. Now, if you want to take a uh, massive array and run a random permutation on that, then by definition you have to have cache misses because you're going to be exchanging uh, um, elements of an array that doesn't fit into memory, and uh, in, into the cache, sorry. And now you have a dilemma. My combinatorics were so good because I took a massive array. Not only did I take a massive array, I also worked, I'm working in parallel on 256-bit registers because otherwise it's going to take me too long to do each operation. So I can get really high efficiency by working on these longer, by working on these longer registers, by taking this massive array, the combinatorics work out really nice. I can shrink the array, but then my combinatorics are gonna become much worse and I'm gonna have to have bigger buckets and I'm gonna lose what I'm going to gain by not having cache misses. So, you have something, for instance, you don't care inside each bucket where a little bit goes. Okay, so that's exactly what we're going to show now is that this, uh, um, concept, concept or, or, or thought that we need to actually carry out a random permutation isn't, isn't the case. You're saying that within the bucket I don't care about the order. In fact, you can even say much, much more than that. In fact, we can even do a much worse permutation than that and we're still going to be okay. So let's see uh, what the aim is. The aim is to construct a cache efficient shuffling for cut and choose. It's not going to be a random permutation. But it'll be a random permutation that's good enough for cut and choose. If we're really lucky, we won't even lose on the combinatorics. If we're not lucky, then we'll lose a little bit on the combinatorics, but we'll still save overall because we have to ha maybe add a little bit more, but we're not losing, but we, we, we're gaining on, on the memory side. By the way, it's an amazing thing if you think about how far we've come in secret computation, that 30% of the time is being wasted because of reading from memory. Okay, that means we're in a very, very good situation, but we do want to solve that problem. Okay. So the first uh, thing that you can think about is actually uh, a different way of looking at what Moni said, which is that instead of generating uh, one massive array and randomly shuffling it, let's generate beta arrays and shuffle beta minus one of them. And then take the buckets to be, the ith bucket to be the ith element in each array. This essentially says I don't care about the order inside the bucket. And it also means that each shuffle itself is on a smaller array. So if I need an array of four million, instead of doing a single permutation on four million elements, I'm going to do four, uh, uh, four permutations, each one on one million, one million elements, and that means I'm using less memory, maybe to go into a different level of the cache. By the way, just for uh, the theoreticians here, there are three levels of cache, L1, L2, L3. Each level of cache gets bigger, but is further away and costs more to read from. Uh, after L3, you have regular memory. So you want to try and be in as low cache as possible. One of the problems that arises though is the L3 cache is quite large, but the L3 cache is shared amongst all of the different processes. So if I have 20 CPUs on a server, 
and I'm using L3 cache, then they can't work in parallel because each one is going to push the other out. That means I actually have to try and get down to L1 or L2 cache uh, or else I'm not going to be gaining anything because I'm going to lose all of my parallelization, parallelism. Okay, so that's, these are the, we're trying to build a combinatorical game, an analysis that will suit the systems constraints that we have to make this thing run very, very fast. Okay, so this is, this is Moni's first idea and this certainly helps. Uh, and we have to open now C elements in each array in order for the component dogs to go through. So we are losing a little bit. Before we had to open only C in the entire 4 million, now we have to open C times beta. But since C is very small, then this actually is insignificant. Opening 4 triples or opening 16 triples or 20 triples, this, this is completely insignificant. We couldn't care less. The second idea is to think about the following thing. Remember that I told you that the best strategy of the adversary is to try and make, make one bucket bad. Now, I'm, go, I'm, I'm cheating you a little bit because when I change the game, maybe the adversary's strategy is also going to change. But we proved that it doesn't change. So let's think for a moment about the fact the best strategy for the adversary is to make one bucket bad. If instead of permuting the entire array, again, we're permuting each of these four or these beta arrays separately, Instead of permuting the entire array, I break the array into subarrays, permute inside each subarray, and then just permute by redirection the subarrays themselves. Then the adversary is the probability of getting all of the uh, a single bucket to be fully bad is exactly the same as if I permuted the entire array. So let's say concretely we have buckets of size five. And I want to make the adversary wants is going to choose five bad balls and they have to all fall in the same position. If I randomly permute this entire array, you know, let's make it easier. I, let's say I have buckets of size two. Okay, this makes it easier. I have buckets of size two. So if I permute the entire array, the probability that they fall in the same bucket is approximately one over n squared, where n is the number of buckets. But if instead I break into subarrays, permute inside each subarray, and then permute the big subarrays, it's the same probability because if both of those balls happen to be in the same subarray, then they're um, oh, sorry, it's because, it's because we, we're doing in between, we're doing between, we have two arrays, so the adversary is going to choose one bad ball in this array and one bad ball in the, in the other array, fix the bad ball in this array if the probability that the ball falls here is 1 over n also using this system. So I s permute within each subarray and then the subarrays, it's also going to be 1 over n and this extends also to, to general beta. So this is as good for cut and choose as a full permutation. We don't even lose, it, lose anything on the combinatoric side. On the parameters, the parameters are just as good, but now we don't have to shuffle the entire array. Not only that, we have the advantage that we can choose the size of the subarray however we want. So we can make the subarray small enough to fit in to whatever level of cache that we have available in the computer that we're actually using. And it's completely flexible. The very, it's very surprising to us. The analysis showed that the size of the subarray actually made no difference to the result at the end. Uh, our computation is that the probability of a bad thing happening is n to the beta minus 1. So this, can, it, this sets the size of the bucket. Thinking what that means, if you have n to be 2 to the power of 20 and you want uh, a security error of 2 to the minus 40, it suffices to take beta equals 3. So we get very, very small parameters because then you would get 1 over 2 to the 20 squared, which is 1 over 2 to the 40. Uh, the final thing that we did, and that's really not a, this, the, before I knew it was nice, it's like, a, it's, a, it's a crypto, it's, it's in a crypto or algorithms, I don't know, but it's crypto design, you have to prove security in, according to this new game. Uh, a simple uh, uh, engineering uh, uh, um, optimization was instead of shuffling the actual elements, only to shuffle indices instead. Because the indices are smaller, and this, uh, you might think, that, okay, that helps in this pre-processing, but afterwards when I'm going to actually work and do the computation of the circuit, now I have an array of indices, my actual array is not going to fit inside cache, and when I pull, when I need to pull, I'm going to have cache misses. You might have thought that would happen, and this would slow you down, but it doesn't slow us down. I guess that there is enough spare time in the semi honest protocol to pull out of array so that it doesn't bother us. We didn't get any slowdown because of that. Theoretically, you could think it may happen, but it, it didn't happen. Uh, so that's the theorem that we proved. 
that the best, uh, the best strategy for, the, the, for every adversary, the adversary will win in this new combinatorial game with one over n to the beta minus one. Uh, as I said beforehand, as when we broke into the first, instead of doing one large array, beta smaller arrays, we had to open C in every array. Now we have to open C in every subarray. So it does affect the cost a little bit because the number of subarrays is now bigger. If I, if I want to make sure everything fits into uh, to a, to a small cache, I'm going to take more subarrays and I am going to be opening uh, a C in each subarray, but it's enough to take C equals one in this game here. So in the, in the long run, this doesn't matter. It will add a few thousand triples overall to create a million. It's not something which we care about. Uh, it, doesn't, doesn't, it, it doesn't affect the efficiency because it's so cheap to generate these triples. OK, so the, uh, um, another, another improvement that we can have is the following. Remember they said that we started at 10 bits per gate and we reduced to 7. How did we do that? The basic approach was to say the following. If I have good triples, then I can verify, I can multiply using those triples, and, uh, and I'm done. But another approach is to say that if you think about it, the multiplication inside the circuit is also a multiplication triple. I'm also generating, gener generating an x, y, and z, where z is supposed to equal x times y. Why don't I use that also as part of the verification? So what I can do is I can generate these triples that won't be correct with probably 1 over n to the beta, but instead 1 over n to the beta minus 1. Here, reusing beta in a different way, so I'm confusing everyone. But instead of being, making it exactly uh, what I want it to be, I'll make it one, I'll make them not secure enough, these triples. But then I'll have an additional n triples which are generated by running, by actually computing the circuit itself. And, the, and I'll verify these against each other, and if it turns out that I multiplied badly in the actual circuit, but the bucket that I'm comparing it with is good, then I'm going to catch the adversary. And if it turns out that is a, a fully bad bucket, but the x times y equals z was computed correctly, then I'll catch the adversary. The only way the adversary will win is if there's a fully bad bucket, and that bad bucket matches up to a bad multiplication in the circuit. And if I do the choice of which bucket to use randomly after I multiply in the circuit, then the adversary won't know, and this will add another 1 over n probability the adversary will win, and I can save an additional 3 bits because I'm saving one set of triples. Each triple costs me 3 bits to generate. So I'm now saving another triple to generate. And this actually reduced the communication from 10 to 7, which is what we wanted, the, but there's a problem. When you're trying to do this, what this means is you have to shuffle after you've computed the circuit. So I'm going to compute the circuit, and then I'm going to shuffle. Now, Danny might be thinking, but you said you don't care about offline online costs, so what do you care? It's not about offline online. The problem is I'm going to be preparing a million triples, and then I want to compute a circuit of size 5,000, and after the circuit of size 7,000, and after the circuit of size 2,000. But I can't generate output until I do the verification, which means I have to do the random shuffling after I computed the circuit, but I haven't done I haven't computed a million gates, I've only computed a few thousand. So now I have to reshuffle this, this large array of triples each time after each few thousand gates, and that's going to slow me down a huge amount. So in order to uh, get around this, we have to define a new combinatorial game, which suits this type of computation, which we call on-demand. So instead of generating one array of triples, like beforehand, that are almost good, because I'm going to do the verification also in the multiplication, I generate two of them. And then, uh, after I generate, I have two arrays of, like this, and every time I do a multiplication, I take a value randomly out of the first array, and then fill it with something from the second array. So this is how it looks graphically. I generate two of these arrays. You know, now I want to verify multiplication in the circuit. I take a random triple from the primary array, and I fill it, and I, and I replace it with something from the second array. And then I take another, uh, uh, for another multiplication, I take another triple from the primary array and fill it with the second array. And when the second array is, is depleted, I now fill it up with a new array uh, of, of, of an, another n triples, and I can continue this on-demand and continuous game. This also defines a new continuous combinatorial game, because it's not like beforehand where you have static n balls that are, that are generated. 
you have to model this. It turns out that it's actually uh, not that difficult to reduce this to the first game, but it, it needs to be analyzed, and we did, and everything works out fine. In the bottom line, at the end, we can compute like we wanted. Uh, we can compute 1.1 billion AND gates per second. Actually, this is even better than, than uh, even though it's seven times slower than the semi honest we get even better than 1 over 7. That's because there were other optimizations that went into this implementation. And this is uh, sort of like uh, as good as the communication will allow us. And in terms of objective, and objectively, Computing 1.1 billion AND gates per second is something that really enables you to do large computations in very, very good time. Again, three-party honest majority, but full malicious security, uh, security with a board. So in summary, uh, in order to obtain really high throughput secure computation, one of the main things you want to do is minimize comp communication, use very simple operations only, and uh, these sort of games, or at least what we did, yields yield interesting combinatorical cut and choose games that uh, with tight analysis gives us very good parameters. And system considerations are also of great importance if you actually want to uh, run these things at scale. You need to make sure that things like memory don't slow you down, uh, even though it's something we may not think about. Uh, this on-demand sort of operation is needed in, in, if you want to run, not run actual computations. You need necessarily not necessarily running on very big circuits. You don't know ahead of time. But all of these things can be dealt with within these types of frameworks and, and can give you very practical protocols. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? There aren't any lower bounds uh, for semi-honest. So, so, yeah, so, we, so for, for, we don't have any lower bounds for semi-honest. Well, we do have partial lower bounds. So Ivan Damgard they, they ha has a paper which looks at um, computing per gates. And even then, it's actually not so easy to get a lower bound, but it's not. We know that for the worst case, but we need to significantly in the circuit side. We need for worst case functions. Yeah. Okay, but that doesn't give you, and if you insist on polynomial time protocols for arbitrary circuits, then you can't, right? Well, for specific types of circuits, you can, you can amortize? Yeah, but if you insist on a polynomial time world, then you don't have these lower bounds. You don't have these upper bounds. That's the problem. We don't have, hmm? We don't have lower bounds either. That's the thing. So I'm, that's what I'm saying. We... Now, if you want to try and compute, do some computational things, then you'd completely die because FHE solves the problem. FHE gives you a protocol which is independent of the circuit size. So what you want to try and say is, I want to understand for maybe a more practical type protocol, can I do anything? It's unclear because neither answers, Yuval's answer doesn't help me there, and FHE doesn't help me there, but it's unclear that you can say anything meaningful. It's very difficult to say anything of meaning. So Kerberos actually, it's the AES operations, and we have AES circuits. I can tell you that in, in, in the company, we have a consultant who builds the circuits that we need. There, are, there is a lot of work around compilers. There are two groups in Germany, and there are others who are working on compilers that compile code to circuits. Speeds has a compiler, which is an arithmetic circuit compiler. It's not really a compiler in that sense, but it takes code and converts it to what's necessary for an arithmetic circuit computation. Uh, but this is an active area of research, uh, how you build these circuits in a generic way. If you know what circuit you want, like you want AES, you want SHA, you want modular multiplication, then you can do that by hand and you can get very, very good results. Thank you very much.